Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ben Sweat. I'm the editor of the Senior Care Investor, and today I'm joined by Jay Wagner and Aaron Rosenzweig of Cushman and Wakefield, and we're gonna be talking about the construction lending market. And my first question is for Aaron. Aaron, which has come, per come back first, or which will come back first, construction lending supply or the demand for it? Sure, uh, thanks Ben. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon. It's nice to connect. Um, yeah, I think that the, uh, look, post COVID, um, the demand for construction debt slowed, um, mostly due to higher costs, but consistently demand has been outstripping supply, uh, much more so post COVID, um, uh, versus pre COVID. Um, uh, we're finding that, um, it's the larger developers and the most well-capitalized developers who are remaining the most active um, in terms of the demand for construction debt. And the smaller, uh, newer developers um, are frankly just less attractive today to, to the construction lenders. Um, and so therefore, um, those, those types of borrowers are less active. Um, overall, we see the, the, the debt supply continuing to loosen. Um, it really, it turned off for probably the better part of a half a year when COVID hit, and then it started to reopen back up. Um, we are seeing uh, just about every household name lender um, come off the sideline at this point, varying degrees on, on capacity. Um, so some are, are trying to get back to full tilt, some are not, not anywhere quite near that yet, um, but over time we expect things to continue to loosen up. Nice. So, Jay, that kind of takes me into my next question, which is, which which were the first lenders to come back into construction lending? Mm -hmm. So, you know, last year, you know, if you kind of page back, you know, called 12 months, right? You know, the, the, the construction market during the summer was more or less non-existent, you know, aside from a, a handful of guys who were just looking to grab market share with, you know, extremely outlandish terms. Um, really, the groups that we saw really starting to come back in were the smaller local and regional banks. Um, and, you know, we were seeing initially some of those guys trying for lower LTCs, you know, in the kind of mid 50s, maybe 60% range. But as we moved through the, the, the fourth quarter of last year, we really started to see those terms normalize and kind of approach what we would consider to be sort of your con con conventional set of senior housing construction loan terms. Um, you know, into 21, again, that kind of, but well, and in Q4, again, it was still pretty quiet with most of the nationals. I mean, there were a handful of deals that were getting done, but it was very, very, it was sleepy. Um, in the first half of 21, I think we saw a continued slowness in that market um, but really as we've kind of moved into the third quarter of this year we've really started to see mo most of the bigger players the household names come back into the space uh, on terms that are again kind of back to pre-covid terms but always caveated with you know th those are with the existing relationship clients you know the strike zone right now is in spite of ev most guys being back is still pretty pretty tight and uh with with you know and there's still a decent amount of deals out there um i think you know in terms of just another thing is that you know there was a period of time last year where we saw the debt funds um their kind of quote unquote non-recourse construction debt really did dry up um when there was not a, an a note lender to kind of take part of their you know of their whole note that they were underwriting to the clients um we've seen that significantly loosen up and now you know there there are a good number of debt funds that are back out there quoting um quoting construction debt for seniors um some of them in fact have quite large appetite uh, particularly for bigger deals got it and, and did you see any lenders that were active in construction lending before the pandemic simply just leave that business altogether no, I don't think that we've really, I mean, short of short of merger activity, right? But I mean, so, uh, but, you know, those those deals have just been it's more consolidation than anything else as opposed to groups leaving the space. Got it. And, and Aaron, how is construction lending just different this time around? I mean, terms may be approaching pre-pandemic levels, but it can't be, you know, a mirror image of what construction lending was like in 2019. Sure. Yeah, um, certainly I think the first thing that we would say is that 
Um, there's that much more emphasis today on existing relationship uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to breaking through into new relationships. It's not to say that they, they can't be done, they're just more difficult. And so, you know, the construction lenders who we um, are marketing to are uh, almost always asking, if, you know, who the sponsor is and do they know them or do they already have a relationship with them? That's certainly a gating issue. Um, and with that um, comes the emphasis too on the borrower's balance sheet as the guarantor. So it's existing relationship, but it's also um, knowing that, um, that the borrower sponsor um, has the, the, the guaranteed backstop uh, to do the deal. So those are, those are two sort of heightened um, emphasized points post-COVID versus pre. Um, I'd say other, other points would be recourse, um, non-recourse uh, availability is less today. Um, you could find it a little bit more easily pre-COVID. Uh, that's a little bit more difficult to obtain um, today. And, you know, just again, back to the, the capacity comment earlier um, that we're coming back to full tilt, but we're not quite back there yet. What that, you know, means just from a, a supply demand standpoint is that the lenders can afford to be that much choosier in the, the ones that they want to make and the, the borrowers who they want to lend to. And so if they've got a certain allocation to make for the year, for example, they're going to allocate um, that capital to the to their really the best opportunities. Not a bad position to be in for you guys then. No, it, I mean it, we it's not, but at the same time, you know, we do um, run across um, prospective clients where it's not necessarily a slam dunk to get the. To get them the loan, you know the, yeah. the ones that we've been intending to work on have been in, you know, high barrier, um, gateway city, coastal markets, where um, you know the market conditions are not going to be a concern. If you're talking about um, a secondary or tertiary area um, with a, a, a thinly capitalized or less experienced sponsor, those those loans are a lot harder to to come by today. And probably some frustrated clients in those situations as well. Uh, that's right. And, and Jay, has due diligence changed much uh, other than just the, you know, how you tour facilities now is, is a little different? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the the manner in which you conduct DD is pretty, uh, I mean, again, particularly for, for new development, right? I mean, your touring dirt doesn't require uh, too much by way of, uh, COVID, uh, being careful around COVID, but um, you know, certainly um, things are taking longer um, than they were even pre-COVID. I think there's the, there's that just general kind of slowdown that, that still is kind of part of the lingering hangover here uh, of the pandemic. Um, you know, I mean, on, on existing properties, we have no issues um, being able to arrange tours on deals that were, that were marketing for sale. Uh, or doing uh, refis on. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that is different um, certainly kind of touches a little more on underwriting, really. Um, and in particular, you know, we have seen a number of lenders being uh, a, a good bit tighter um, around stabilized occupancy rates, uh, rate growth assumptions. Um, you know, there was a, a deal that we worked on and, and completed just recently uh, as a construction financing involving an adaptive reuse of an existing office building. And the lenders penalized our underwriting just kind of given that it was going to be a non-purpose built nature of the project, which ultimately resulted in a, a slightly lesser LTC than, you know, what we had ideally hoped for. So the something more like 60% as opposed to 65, which is kind of the norm of what we typically see. Mm -hmm. And for underwriting, is there any... Uh, just thought about a potential drop in demand for seniors housing services in the next few years, or just it, any thought to that? I don't. I don't think. I don't think we're seeing. A, it's not so much around well, a drop in it. demand. I think it has Correct. more to do with just the fact that there is a lot of, you know, competition um, for releasing, right? And so I think when when borrowers are looking at their underwriting, I do think that they're stressing their underwriting, particularly as it relates to lease up assumptions. Um, not necessarily that that's informing the ultimate decision, but everyone is very, is looking very carefully at kind of what that leasing velocity looks like if it's not, you know, the base case, so to speak. Got it. And Aaron, is the range of 
loan to values that you see for construction loans different for A quality properties versus B quality properties right now? Um, sure. Although I think I would um, restate that just to say that you know it's the A properties who are getting the loans today, and the B properties are um, at least from where we're sitting uh, not getting them. I mean they'll mm -hmm. they'll come back. But yeah, of course, in general, the higher the quality, um, the project, the better terms and leverage you're going to get. I mean, le with, with respect to, to leverage specifically, um, loan to cost is um, mostly a function of what the stabilized debt service coverage ratio is going to be on the project. And it's also, it also has a lot to do with the strength of the guarantor um, on the guarantee. And so when we've been successful getting pushing up to 70% loan to cost, um, it's because that stabilized coverage um, is there. And, you know, frankly, what's been happening in this post COVID environment is because costs are up, returns are down, and so is that stabilized ESCR. And so it's become more difficult to get to 70% um, in some instances where we've been um, topping out with a lot of lenders more in that 65%. Um, range. Got it. And Jay is, I think the big reason why construction lending dried up or just construction itself during the pandemic dried up is because people just saw it as an incredible risk to have an, a completely empty property and have to fill it up potentially during a pandemic or at least in the tumultuous years after it. Um, but on the other hand, the new the new communities Yes, you have fill-up risk, but they should be kind of the best-in-class communities in the area, be best positioned to fill up post-pandemic. So just to play devil's advocate a little bit, is new construction like seen at, or should be seen as risky? You know, look, construction is always risky, right? Just because, I mean, you know, you have your kind of two buckets of risk, right? You have your construction bucket on the one hand and then you're kind of leasing uh bucket on the other right in a sense and those are two very separate and distinct although they do they do uh work together um you know look in terms of kind of the slowdown in, in new construction i mean i think that you know that was something that predated the pandemic but just excel was accelerated really or you know the, the pandemic acted, acted as a catalyst for that and initially it was, you know, what you typically see in a in any kind of downturn, right? Which is it's just that kind of freezing up of liquidity, uh, which uh, was what really drove that the, the big fall off last year. You know, into this year, the capital markets, the liquidity has come back. It's really now it's been more of a pricing issue. Um, there have been a number of deals that we know of that just, you know, where deals had been greenlit by investment committees. Uh, on the equity side, and by the time they got their GMP contract all ready to go, you know, pricing had surged by 20, you know, 20, you know, 20 percent in some instances, and all of a sudden, a deal that was viable was no longer viable. Um, and so, you know, I do think that we are, you know, just overall supply chain issues remain a challenge for construction. Um, we are seeing pricing starting to starting to retrench a little bit. So it, it does seem to think that, you know, there, we, I mean, I, I believe that we should be seeing some improvement uh, and, you know, construction should start to pick back up again. Um, in terms of the risk, again, I, I would agree with your with your sentiment that, you know, the newer product definitely um, is, is better positioned to compete. Um, and, you know, it, it is just so interesting to see, you know, just even buildings that we've been through that were built, say, two years ago, three years ago, that looked amazing then, you know, when you look at the new crop of what comes out and that kind of constant innovation of design and, and, and you know, materials, um, you know, even the newer product makes even that look dated, right? Uh, which, which, I, which always blows Oh, that'll give heartburn every... to a lot of owners and operators. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. Well, look, everyone, everyone in this business is striving to do a really good job and to, you know, deliver product that resonates with, with, the, with the market. And I think that, you know, we have a lot of really talented people in our business that, that do that and kind of bring the game you know every every day on their development projects um i think you know one of the areas that i think is is a major area of interest and we'll continue to see more of our our groups that are really 
targeting, you know, and this is kind of the counter the leasing story of it a little bit, because um, I think construction risk is construction risk. I think you, you have more and more groups that are really trying to target um, that kind of middle market product, you know, something that is more broadly affordable for the consumer, um, something where, you know, you either investors or lenders generally feel more comfortable underwriting, you know, certain levels of rent growth because you're just starting at a lower level to begin with, right? And you you also are appealing to a broader audience. So, you know, I think that, you know, that's that that's where you're going to continue to see more push. And, you know, the active adult product kind of fits in nicely in that bucket, really. And I, I think that, you know, we're going to continue to see more active product getting built um, as well as more middle market seniors, you know, conventional seniors product being built. And with this, you know, the new construction wave potentially coming, Aaron, what's the interest been like from outside investors that previously previously have not been in investing in seniors housing? Yeah, sure. And and by that, do you mean uh, on the lending side or on the equity side, or both? Both. Okay. Um, yeah, on the lending side, um, on, the, on the conventional lending side, we haven't seen that many new entrants post-COVID. Mm -hmm. It's certainly been uh, more of the opposite, where there's been some more, there's been more retrenching. Um, we have been successful with um, more local, regional types when things were slow. Those are the types of groups who kind of stand to benefit when the larger players are sidelined. So, and some of those groups, you know, might do one or two or three senior housing loans a year or so um, to that to that end, a little bit of new entry. Um, on the equity side, more so. I mean, certainly um, there's we, we've noticed um, our sales practice. Uh, we've been interfacing with with a lot new a lot of new names uh, on the distress side, looking for um, deals to gobble up. And then um, we've noticed too that um, there are some other institutional names who uh, were more active in the sector um, last cycle or even the cycle before, and then kind of have been quiet and they're reemerging. And so there are a handful of those names um, that are household institutional investor type of names uh, that we've seen uh, come back with uh, a renewed interest uh, post COVID. Yeah, and and just on on that note, I would also add that you know we, we're there are a good number of kind of household names that are there with just kind of now with access to new pools of capital, um, in addition to kind of what they've been playing with historically, which is kind of you know mixing things up a little bit on the investor side. So I want to wrap up uh, with a question for both of you, and it's kind of a two part question. So, what is your prediction just for the rate of new development in the next couple of years? And then for the rest of the 2020s, uh, Jay, mm -hmm. we can start with you. Yeah. So look, I think um, I think new starts are going to continue to fall off in the near term. Um, you know, certainly probably for the balance of this year. Um, you know, we'll we'll see that. Um, we should start to see some rebound of that next year, is what I'm anticipating. Um, particularly if hard costs start to start to fall uh, more dramatically. You know, we we think that that'll jumpstart a, a lot of new development. Um, right now. You know, it's kind of the you know the the fittest and the strongest are the ones who are getting it done. Um, you know, the 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 largest groups and the best capitalized developers. Um, they certainly seem to seem to be the busiest right now, and you know that that's probably going to continue for the you know certainly for the next six to nine months is what we're anticipating. Aaron. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a whole lot more to add to what Jay just said. I think um, you know I agree that. Um, we're not expecting um, construction to inventory uh, to flip the switch anytime soon. We think that curve still continues to go down uh, for some months. Um, we're also hearing that um, you know certain certain um, building materials are coming in, and so uh, that might loosen up new starts as well. And um, you know we'll just see. So. Whether it's 12 months away or, or three years away from kind of getting back to where we were pre-COVID on new supply, mm -hmm. um, or maybe it, maybe it'll take longer. Um, but I think that we we believe that it will come back. Um, it's just a matter of time, and obviously the the, the demos and the, the baby boomer 
story is going to fuel that uh, continued demand, but the capital markets have to have to align as well. And you know, it'll be it it, it won't be uniform. Uh, there's going to continue to be some um, you know some pain and suffering uh, on the debt side. Um, there, you know, we see the trend right now. We we see continuing, which is not only the best sponsors but the best sites. So when you're asking earlier about A and B, um, you know, we think that the the new starts are certainly going to be trending toward those better markets as opposed to secondary tertiary anytime soon. Well, that's that's good to hear. I'm I'm sure a lot of existing owners and operators will be happy to know that starts won't get you know too heated in the next couple of years. So they can work on filling their units, and we'll hopefully see if demand's there and and three to five years when development starts to probably pick up a little more. Well, most of these lenders that are doing construction are also, you know, have thriving uh, new financing and refinancing business lines, right? And I think we're seeing, you know, just a ton of debt liquidity in the market right now. Um, you know, a lot of the kind of the predicted distress, I think, is not going to materialize just because so much refi activity is going on where mm -hmm. people are getting the additional time that they need to uh, to write the ship, so to speak, as we continue to refill the industry. Yeah, and M&A is gonna keep a, a lot of lenders busy as well. Oh yes. You guys. <laughs> yeah, we've been, uh, we've been on a, you know, certainly on the construction side, we've had, a, we've had a great run over these past 12 months. I mean, we haven't had a single failed assignment. It's, you know, we've, we've been able to accomplish them and you know, we've gotten them done on very attractive terms. So, and, you know, we're, we're, we continue to be extremely busy on the construction debt side um, in spite of everything that we've just said. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. All right, Jay, Aaron, thanks so much for your time and, and your insights. And uh, we'll, we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Ben. Really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thanks, thanks Ben. Ben.